coming from North or South America or other places from the world. And then welcome to the first uh, Petrium System webinar in 2022. Our webinars are usually on the last Thursday of each month and there will be a series uh, after this one. So the first one will be given by Dr. Daniel Palmowski, the product champion of Petromod from Schlumberger. Daniel has been working for uh, Schlumberger and Petromod for about 15 years with Petrium System Modeling, with the development and the application of the Petromod software. And then during the last year, the last seven years, he's been employed in different roles as product analyst and product manager for the software in the Basin and Petroleum Systems Modeling Group at the Schlumberger Aachen Technology Center in Germany. And basically the talk will be about the role of Basin modeling in carbon capture and storage projects played to prospect workflows. So now we will have quite many people who signed up, about 100, around 140. So everybody will be muted during the session. If you have questions, please write them in the chat. And at the end, we can read up the questions. And also you, you will have the possibility to raise a hand and unmute yourself. And then we will select the people to talk after the presentation. So I switch my, my, my camera off and then basically Daniel, the floor is yours. Thanks, Balash, and thanks especially for this invitation and uh, to have the opportunity here to be the first speaker of the year. Um, but that's a very big honor, and I appreciate that um, that trust and uh, give us the opportunity here to talk about uh, CCS applications, which is, from our analysis, uh, like a really uh, a booming booming thing. Everyone tries to uh, diversify a little bit away from our classical. Um, uh, workload um, and of course we as uh, software vendors um, we are not just uh, only interested in you know in, in, in always in keeping the status quo it's our interest to of course make sure that our users also have um, uh, reasons to do a job and uh, so if if um, we can help them diversify themselves away a little bit from the petroleum system and go into other applications uh, such as CCS or even others like pop pressure predictions or so um, we are, of course, uh, very um, keen in supporting that. And so, to start, I would like to really make this very first comment. This presentation today is not about showcasing how great we are and what great things we can do. It's more about um, giving us, um, let's say, a comfortable feeling that we have a lot to deliver for CCS, um, but there is still a lot of work to be done to make it a real um, uh, fit-for-purpose uh, tool. Um, but be because we are so used to it, I think we can, you will see that there's a lot of um, things we can already do today um, to support the CCS uh, exploration and, uh, and, and, uh, and decision making process. Okay, so um, what, what we want to do, of course, is basically um, going doing an exploration game for CCS in a similar way as we do it uh, for hydrocarbons, right? Um, I think it's obvious that if we want to sell as a as a, as an operator a certain storage site to CO2 polluters and say, hey, I buy, I will take on your CO2 and I will inject it for you into the into the subsurface, and uh, you know you pay me for that service and everything will be fine. Then we better make sure that we can fulfil, let's say, a, a 20 year contract um, and that we don't have any leakage in between. Uh, because so that's similar to is if you would sell. Um, the content of, a, of an oil field that you discovered to a customer uh, and after five years you start, start pumping water. So we need to avoid that. And to do that, we of course would like to, um, you know, we need to work that basin, those plays and prospects in a very similar way. So when we look at our existing simulators um, and our basin analysis to basin modeling workflows, there are a lot of things that we already do, let's say, by default, that um, deliver a lot of insight uh, for CCS decision making. So, for example, the present day petrophysical properties and prediction of those, uh, such as the porosity of the reservoir and its distributions, um, seal capacities. And of course, in general, we do consider the geological history uh, to derive these parameters. So, um, uh, the present day burial depth, for instance, is not exactly delivering a good idea about uh, the porosity of a reservoir, for instance, or the seal capacity, because the 
historical maximum barrel depth will be um, of importance. You will see this later in this talk, how important it can be. And so uh, when it comes to storage capacity assessment, um, similar to the uh, hydrocarbon uh, in place volumes, for example, um, uh, and its assessment, you know, we need to think about the theoretical capacities. We need to, of course, make an analysis about where do we inject um, and uh, and how many injection wells do we need? And that all depends on, on fascist analysis, on, on general, on base analysis, understanding, and of course, also on those pretty physical predictions, right? So all these insights that we generate from our modeling that we also do, it's just like for the hydrocarbons, we will also pass on into the assessment team to assess the, the proper sites to have a ranking, which site is the most likely one and uh, or the best one to be used for for specific uh, operations. So today's agenda, you know, I want to uh, quantify, of course, I want to show how we can quantify a basin-wide storage capacity very simply with ex maybe even existing petroleum systems models. Um, and then I want to focus more on the play scale and to see, OK, what can we do more on a play uh, level uh, when it comes to uh, more data, higher resolution uh, geology and, um, and and maybe higher resolution uh, geometries as well. Uh, and that's where we'll also illustrate how important these uh, present day pretty physical property predictions can be. Um, at the very end, I will briefly come back to this assessment thing and this uh, you know, uh, basin to prospect uh, aspect again to remind us all of this importance. And of course, a very brief uh, to-do list that what I see and I would like to invite you all, especially our customers, uh, to join us and to make sure that we discuss this together and to uh, make sure that we de develop uh, the solutions that you need for your current problems uh, and uh, and not beyond. And so to make sure that we do the right things. But before we start, let's have a look at the physics um, a little bit. And so, so CO2 is a little bit of a uh, specific molecule that we need to look at and uh, some aspects that are different to when it comes to migrating methane, for example. And so um, the first one is when we talk about column heights. And so um, this property of this interfacial tension, this IFT value, um, is very different for the CO2 than it is for the methane. Uh, you see that here in the, the table, the CO2 uh, IFT value is about half the value of that of, uh, of methane. What does that mean? It, the smaller the IFT, the easier it is to enter a small capillary, right? So that means that if you have a small IFT value, the potential column height with a given seal capacity of your seal of this so-called capillary entry pressure uh, will be smaller. So that's not so good for the CO2 compared to a methane value. However, the, the advantage, of course, is that the CO2 has a much higher density than the, the methane. And so therefore, this is kind of counter uh, compensated. And in this particular example, I show in this table here, you see that the column heights are almost equal because of the, the density you see here for an 80 cubic uh, uh, kilograms per cubic meter compared to 175 for the methane. Um, that kind of compensates, equalizes each other out, out. That may be different in different scenarios, right? So, but it's, it is, of course, uh, uh, helping that the CO2 is significantly denser uh, in the subsurface than our methane is. Second one is that the, the CO2 um, is slightly polar compared to the to the methane. Um, of course, not as strongly polar as H2S is, but because of its uh, slight polarity, we do see much improved dissolution uh, possibilities of the CO2 in the water phase. And, and because of that, um, that opens, of course, uh, Opportunities, so we can use the water, the water phase as a storage container, of course, right? Deep cell and aquifer, or and or, of course, it has also uh, a migration uh, opportunity here by, by by diffusion, and the diffusion um, can be an advantage, of course, or especially, but of course, also a different advantage uh, because diffusion through um, through a seal is certainly something that needs to be considered. Um, depend, of course, on the thickness of the seal, etc. Right. So that we're not talking about uh, meters per minute uh, of diffusion, um, but we're talking about meters per, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. So it depends, of course, how long, how, how long of a time uh, uh, period we need to look at. Uh, you can see that, um, of course, the diffusion coefficient 
uh, is highly dependent on the porosity. So for a seal where we tend to have low porosities, of course, then of course the the uh, diffusion effect will be slightly uh, will be certainly small. Um, but for thin uh, seals, that's certainly something that needs to be uh, considered. And so if we just use an academic example, you see here, so in white pixels at the, in the top uh, cross sections, that is our, our accumulation pixels, so this invasion population pixels from the migration analysis. Um, you see that there's a, a, you know, a, a, a heterogeneous genius, uh, fascist distribution, so that, the, the, that not all of the cells actually are reservoir quality cells. Um, and you see here um, the the, uh, the dissolution of, of of CO2 in water and color scale. So you see here mass in water um, in megatons, and you see that um, after a, a period of time, that kind of spreads out from that original original accumulation. Of course, that accumulation is growing during the phase of injection. But after 50 years of storage, on the very right hand side, you see that. You know, by diffusion, this is slightly, you know, uh, uh, growing that that amount of uh, mass in the water. Okay, so uh, let's start with this quantifying the storage capacity. Then the USGS um, has uh, put out a very interesting uh, publication. Um, uh, I will show this in a minute. But the very first step, or the very si most the most simplest solution, of course, everyone can do is is using a, a simple you know, migration analysis on any structural map, right? You just say, okay, there's a certain seal capacity as a map, for instance, uh, you can inject uh, uh, CO2 and then you can see, okay, where, where do I have breakthroughs? Uh, where is a fill and spill path? So if I, for example, uh, inject here, where I have this gray arrow pointing down, this is my injection well, let's say, I can fill this, uh, this uh, structure here uh, up to spill, which is this red outline. This is my spill point line, basically. And you see then the yellow path here. This is the spill path uh, into the next highest uh, uh, structure, a very small one. But again, that can be filled to spill. But the next one it's spilling into can no longer be filled to spill. You see that the accumulation is, is much smaller than the actual uh, uh, spill point line. Um, but we will have a seal limit here. So we will get breakthrough. So if we are injecting more than uh, then uh, into this well here to fill to up to the column height and break through here, then we get leakage, right? And so this is, of course, something we would like to avoid. And so this is a very simple analysis already to see, okay, how are these structures connected and where do I, uh, where could I get a breakthrough, which I did not want. So to make sure if I want to connect different structures with a single injection well with a fill and spill path, then that is certainly a very quick way of analyzing things. Of course, we need to consider the CO2 densities, the CO2 IFT values here for this analysis, right? This is uh, uh, crucial. Okay, speaking of the USGS, USGS um, assessment uh, approach. So um, they, they have used, or they have basically converted also their, their suggested approach uh, for hydrocarbons to the uh, CCS world. And so they come up with these so-called storage assessment units, um, so-called SAUs. And they are basically a mappable volume of rock, right, F from a for a porous reservoir into which we can inject hydrocarbon. Uh, sorry, uh, CO2, of course, um, and um, and and that CO2 will be then kept in that reservoir unit by these bounding regional seeding formations, right? That is the idea. And so we can map that. We can uh, um, look at a bigger areas and smaller areas, etc. So um, how is that storage? Uh, assessment unit defined? Well, uh, we have different methods or different possibilities of storing CO2 in the subsurface. There's, of course, this buoyant trapping I just showed you in the in this map analysis uh, slide. Um, so this is the, the, the buoyant tra trapping storage resource you see here in the cross section in blue. Um, um, and and uh, there is, of course, a maximum and a minimum one for each of the structures, just like I showed you in the previous uh, map exercise. Uh, there's one that the minimum is the one that is, is, is seal uh, seal dependent, and the maximum is spill point dependent, of course. Um, and um, then there's also you see it here in green uh, the so-called residual storage resource, um, which is basically everything in between the different uh, structures. Um, and there they did differentiate between different permeability cutoffs. So there's a, a an RS1, 2, and 3, dependent on whether you are 
uh, whether the probability is above one Darcy or it's between one and one milli Darcy or it's below one milli Darcy. Um, and of course, there's a certain cutoff as well with a minimum burial or minimum depth uh, sub sub land or sub uh, um, mud line. Um, of course, so that the CO2 that we inject will stay in the supercritical state at high densities. Uh, so this is a typical depth between 3,000 and 13,000 feet here. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, we can, of course, then uh, have to look, of course, at vector growth as well, uh, etc. And of course, if you would like, you can even extend this entire exercise also into probabilistic calculations. So. Let me show you uh, a brief example of what we have done. So we're using here um, a data set uh, from, from, uh, uh, that we often use for, for demonstrating things from the Gibson Basin in Australia. Thankful, thankfully, we have this data set from Geoscience Australia. And so our input here was a simple simulated uh, uh, model. Uh, doesn't even have to have a, a petrol system on it. It just needs to have, of course, the pressures and the temperatures. Um, and uh, uh, we need this, of course, to calculate the CO2 densities uh, from te pressure temperature PVT uh, analysis. We need the porosities, of course, for the volumetrics and the permeability. We need that, of course, as you realize this for the for the for the bracketing of these uh, um, residual storage units. And so we wrote a script to extract this information from the output um, with this with Petromod has an open simulator that allows you to do that. Um, and then we applied these filters um, as needed, and, and we were putting out uh, a report uh, for the assessment units um, with the different storage containers uh, and their, 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 the masses that are potentially stored in there. Um, and you can then visualize that in, 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 in our viewer. Uh, so in this, in this model here, we basically have eight formations that are within this uh, depth bracket, um, which then have a total of these 100 assessment units. Um, and you see here now a map in the lower right uh, for the uh, Cobia formation, for instance. And you see that always uh, there is a, a structure trap uh, and uh, the residual storage uh, uh, um, area uh, um, associated with it. Um, so that is basically almost the, always the case. And so you can subdivide these, these, uh, this area extent of your reservoir into these uh, units. And then you can, of course, look at the uh, at the at the vo uh, volumes or masses, uh, of course, better um, that you can store inside. Um, and you see here, uh, you know, the um, uh, the, the statistics um, for selected uh, points here. So um, you know, this 13, this big one here is this this upper one here. Uh, the, the small one is here. You see this only blue and, and red. Red means the um, uh, means the uh, buoyant storage, right? And uh, blue in this case. Uh, is the uh, is the residual reservoir, um, which is where it is this R three? I think that this is the color is just unfortunately a little bit wrong here. Um, and uh, so for this cobia, uh, there's a total of 45 megatons that we can store in there. Uh, in this in this three, that is the lowest permeability. If you remember, remember lowest permeability part, um, and only two megatons are in this um, in the buoyant storage. So you can see that the majority of tonnage. Actually Actually goes into this residual container, and only a very small portion is in this buoyant container. The big question, of course, is how can we charge this residual container? How can we get that CO2, you know, spread out enough so that it actually uh, 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 fills this this potential? Okay, and then at the moment we have all this on in Excel. Of course, it's not really there's no interface. Um, but you can make these screaming curves, and you can you know look at tables, and you can sort things, and you can you know, even, you know, uh, automate uh, certain reporting by creating, uh, of course, um, the plots that we would like. Okay, so let's have a look uh, at more place specific aspects. And so what we did is we um, we downloaded the data set from uh, this co2datashare.org website that you're probably all familiar with. Um, I don't need to go into too much detail. And honestly, I'm not a big local geologist there. So everything I show you here today is is not about getting you the giving you uh, basically an answer. It's just to it's a basically I use the, we use this as a as a playground, let's say, to test out things to see you know what aspects are important and to create some somewhat a story. So please don't whatever I show you now in, in numbers, 
don't take these as any any uh, uh, values that you should consider for your own work in the same area. And so maybe someone can um, even you know tell me how good or how bad I was. But anyway, so this is the data set. We have the seismic. We have some horizon interpretations. So here you see in yellow here, this is our reservoir unit. Um, and there are two key faults, of course, one on the eastern and one on the western side with this big rollover on the east. Um, and um, so the big question, of course, is how important is this fault uh, how, uh, on each side? Um, and to, 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 to basically test this out, we create these four injection wells at which we can inject CO2 um, for a certain period of time and a certain amount. Um, and uh, so we did 40 years of injection and 60 years of storage to just see you know, how different processes uh, uh, run. And, and, and these four red locations here. So two eastern ones that basically drain up deep into this Urgarden fault complex, and then two that basically should drain uh, to the west into this vetter fault uh, complex here. Okay, if I, if I make a very simple scenario, so where I say, okay, my reservoir is uniform, pure sand, all good, I have no top seal issue, um, and I inject a certain amount uh, so that I can get basically uh, a, a spill to the side or uh, um, uh, up the fault. And so if I have an open fault, a scenario now that I have, so there's no uh, uh, sea capacity within the fault, then I get about a total mass uh, that I can inject of 80 million tons before I have losses through a spill to the side. And you see that, the, that of course, the two uh, eastern injection wells, they drain towards the east, the western ones drain to the west, all as we expected. Although here the accumulations are small because there's surface losses you can see here, um, uh, because here there is a uh, there was a um, uh, a hole in the seal basically. Um, if I create now um, uh, 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 sorry 10 megapascal capillary entry pressure uh, seal capacity on the fault, of course I can store a lot more before I get a, a, a spill, and uh, and so I get uh, you know uh, 320 megatons before I spill out. Now. Here in this particular plot, we plotted the accumulation in red, right? It doesn't mean it's a vapor, as you perhaps may think, right? It's just that we colored it in red. Later on, I did not do that anymore. I, I just keep it green. It's not liquid. It's, of course, a supercritical CO2, right? So it's just a, that's just to make sure that we understand each other. I mentioned already CO2 is very much dissolvable in water. So, um, so here you see on the left hand side uh, the amount of uh, 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 CO2 uh, dissolved in the water. So 3.3 megatons overall in this entire model area. You see here nicely where, where the injector wells are. Uh, you have this, uh, the, all the, 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 it's also dissolved there. And then of course uh, in the migration there's only residual saturation. So there's very little remaining in the, in, in the water phase. Um, based on the, the algorithm we used, but of course in the accumulations it's quite significant. Um, if you look carefully at these accumulations, and you see here and the other pop out, this white area are actually the accumulation dots. Now I, we made them white so that they are more visible, and you see uh, the diffusion of the methane, uh, sorry, sorry, of the CO2 uh, inside the water phase away from that accumulation, right? So that's uh, an interesting uh, effect here. Um, we also did some very simplistic um, uh, carbonatization, so carbonate formation or cement forming due to CO2 uh, uh, presence uh, using a simple activation energy base and frequency factor based kinetics. So it's not something that is controlled on any chemical parameters, it's simply controlled on temperature and time. So how realistic that is needs to be discussed, but it's just to see, to show that you know, there are ways of, of quantifying things, and, uh, and so you can see here also it's not huge based on what we have on the pro on the settings that we used. Um, but that is uh, certainly something. This container that we uh, can uh, create or may may want to avoid depends on the situation because carbonate cement can either be a, a, a great thing because we store the CO two basically. Permanently, it can be a bad thing because it blocks the pore space and pore throats for migration and further injection. So it can have can go both ways, right? And of course, dissolution of carbonate due to the acidity of the water that we create. This is another issue, of course, is the inverse. And of course, that should also be considered in some form or the other, maybe um, once we understand what are the relativity factors. That is, I think, the key 
challenge here. Of course, um, an accumulation is uh, pretty complex, and so uh, uh, you know the saturations inside a, a reservoir body, um, as we know, are of course uh, you know uh, not not uniform. At the very top, where the column height is highest, we have the highest saturations, and at the oil, uh, at, at the gas water contact here, the CO two water contact, we have of course the uh, critical gas saturation at the bottom here. So you can see this you now just plotted on this saturation plotted on our accumulation bodies here, just to show this again. Um, so you see here in this, in this one equation, for example, the mass is eight megatons of, uh, um, uh, of CO2. Um, if you would convert this into the, if it would be a methane accumulation for the, with the same parameters, same porosity, same seal capacity, different IFT, different uh, uh, buoyancy pressure because different uh, densities, you will get six megatons of CO2, uh, uh, methane into it, right? So you can already see in this particular case, remember, it's not one to one. It's a little bit. It's a little bit different. Okay, and then of course you can make some form of of uh, um, uh, balances as well, mass balances um, through time. So on the horizontal axis, you know, time. Uh, uh, this is not time, uh, not in years, but in in, in, in tens of years. Um, and so that's fifty years, right? Remember, fifty years of injection and uh, uh, sixty years of of storage. And um, so we see how the free gas is increasing, of course, uh, the in water is increasing, it is dissolved in water, uh, carbonate cement is forming, um, we have some diffusion losses, and we, of course, we also have migration losses uh, in general. This is for the entire model area, right? And for the different scenarios, you see here with this uh, closed fault or the ceiling fault, we got significantly higher uh, capacity, of course, and therefore, uh, the free gas phase especially is significantly higher um, uh, compared to the other one. The water phase is slightly is 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 then in relative terms much smaller, right? So the amount of C two dissolved in water compared to the pre phase. Okay. Let's have a look at some geology, actually. So what I just showed you was basically for a perfect scenario, right? Perfect reservoir, perfect seal. Now, if you look at this image again, um, and I just colored in here, this is actually the drop in a seal, shale seal that should be on top here, right? And you can see that the present day burial of that seal is, is less than a kilometer deep, right? And I mean a kilometer deep, that is not, that's, not, that's not below mud line, it's actually below sea level, right? So it's very shallow. And so, but we already know, well, that's not a big problem, probably because because look, we have an angular conformity here. There was a lot of erosion, and therefore, that you know, that that that, that is not the present. That that is not the maximum burial. That that shale was buried deeper, and therefore, of course, uh, we can explain the observed porosity of this seal, which was in this report that we downloaded something around average, some twelve percent reported. So the question is, of course, you know, how can we get to twelve percent porosity, right? So how much erosion? was there or how much additional burial was there in the past to explain that porosity. So we built a new model with this fascist in there, so you can see a much minor, finer fascist resolution. That's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pure interpolation between uh, the well data, so it's not based on any seismic inversion or so. It's probably not 100% correct, but it's just to illustrate the opportunities that uh, uh, that we need to, or the, the, the issues that we need to consider, right? You see here in gray, this is our shell unit, and I, in this case, and also we there, we, we we said, okay, well, let's let's make that simple. Let's not not have you know um, pathways through the sh through the seal by some sand bodies that may be connected. So let's keep this a homogeneous uh, shale unit. That's what that's why it's all gray. It's only shale, um, but again, that's certainly artificial. There's certainly also some vertical and horizontal uh, variations. Okay, um, and then. I looked at this this problem with the, with the porosity. So if I use my normal standard compaction curve for a shale, there's this black line here. You see that I get 12% porosity at a burial of about two two kilometers and, and two two thousand one hundred meters or a little bit more. Again, don't forget this is of course hydrostatic, right? So if, as soon as I have overpressures, this number will increase. Um, and um, so then I looked at this unconformity and I restored this with some erosion thicknesses until I thought mm, that's 
I have to keep to be in judge of the reason. So how much could it be? So it's around a kilometer and a half roughly that I uh, said, you know, is something that could be still be pr plausible. But then I still wasn't able to re reconstruct the 12% uh, porosity due to this overpressure. So I had to go uh, and change that compaction curve slightly so that I get with this kilometer and a half roughly erosion um, at this 12%. Okay, so that's that's why these two different compaction behaviors plus the erosion will deliver me then the processes I was desiring. So that's my kind of calibration, let me say, uh, of the seal capacity, right? Um, so you, you see now the prosty, you see this is the this is the eastern side, present day the highest point. This is the western side, present day much lower, but higher porosities, lower porosities because of this different differential burial, right? So high high erosion on the on the eastern side, low erosion on the western side. Now there are of course other things that in the real world example you would need to consider. That is, for example, the net and gross of the shale. I already mentioned this, right? We have pure shale only. Um, of course, the overpressure is an important thing. Um, and uh, so that needs to be also looked at. Um, and of course, cementation could also change the porosity of your shale and therefore the, the seal capacity of the shale. So this is also something that I ignored and did not look at. So what is the result? So if I look now at my best guess results, so with this with this amount of erosion and with this new compaction curve, right, with the same injection that we just saw, I showed you, so you know the injector wells here with these blue arrows, they are only four, remember, right? Um, and these vertical dots are CO2 direct going to the surface, right? So these are losses that are or leaks direct to the surface. Um, in yellow, you see the base reservoir horizon, just to give you some idea of the geometries. Um, and the first thing that you see is that here there's no migration towards the west. And we also know why. It's because everything I inject there directly leaks to the surface because my seal is simply not good enough. There's not enough erosion in my model to have a seal capacity that, capacity that is uh, good enough. If I look on the other injectors, yes, there are also leaking, right? There's some leakage as well, um, but not enough, probably not enough. So there's still some migration here up dip into this into this uh, uh, garden fault and I uh, have an accumulation, although as you can see, it's only here in the southern part. The northern part is not charged at all. There's no migration this way. Again, there is leakage here on the way up dip. And I will show you in a minute later on why that is the case. So here you see in, in light green is our accumulation bodies. In darker green, this is migration pixels, OK? And you see that here we have about 6 megatons instead of these 8 megatons in our first example, remember, in this open fault example. The fault is still not relevant. We cannot get enough in here to fill it so that the fault um, uh, makes any, uh, uh, any, has any sealing, um, any sealing uh, mechanism. The column height simply cannot get high enough, right? But I also maybe you know, it depends on where you put the fault, how is the fault at the right position that, of course, needs to be checked as well. So let's have a look at this area here uh, from a map view point of, point of view. Here on the left hand side, you see now the map. You remember, this is the last, this is the easternmost uh, injector. Um, and here you see the, the update migration from the other injector further to the west. Um, so, and you can see here in our reservoir, we have this heterogeneity of of uh, of uh, of lithotypes, and I only only show you the sand and the shale. You see there are some white gaps in there. That's also because there's also some silt in our model that I'm not showing here because then you won't see anything anymore. Uh, but what's interestingly interestingly is that you know we don't get any update migration here further to the northeast because we have this shale body here with a small little embayment of sand inside, which is filled with CO2. And the column height there is then so high that we get leakage to the surface from here directly. So there's no migration path, basically, um, up dip to the northeast. So you see that here again uh, in, in a 3D view, same thing. Injector going into this into this shale, kind of into this stratigraphic trap, basically, right? And then leaking to the, to the surface at the highest point here. If I now say, well, hmm, Daniel, you have one and a half kilometer erosion, that 
that's a bit that's a bit steep you know that's way too much i think that's is, there's something we need to consider right well if that's the case and i don't change anything that's not working right then i have not they have no c capacity you see that here right I, so if i if i reduce it to let's say 750 meters so 50 percent erosion right roughly i mean only talking about the maximum one right with this 1500 um so 50 less overall uh, basically does not bury our seal deep enough uh, to have any seal capacity. So completely inadequate, not a good idea, not a good scenario. So either we have more erosion, so more, more burial, or we have other processes that need to be considered, such as cementation, that also can increase our seal capacity. That's, of course, a possibility. If I go to 80% of my best guess scenario, um, I get a little bit more, but again, not really, right? It's 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 not that great. Um, so you can see nothing reaches here these highest points. Um, so we will have to inject here locally to get something there. If we inject here down dip, uh, the CO2 will not make it to, to the actual track. So of course this is always an, op an option to, to change the injection locations. It's the same, you know, if we see tracheographic traps uh, that we don't would like to avoid, of course, you know, the location of your injectors are uh, uh, need to be chosen wisely at the right location. Okay, and I think um, that that has shown a little bit how important this present, you know, this this basin modeling part of the CCS workflow is, and uh, and I have the feeling that you know we as petroleum systems modelers are pretty well equipped to make a good um, uh, make a good um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, story here to say hey let's have a look at the geology before we decide on on, on where we should uh, inject right because just a, th a thick seal does not mean that it is good enough to store uh, the co2 for over periods of time that are uh, are required right that's a very important uh, uh, well thing that we all know, but, uh, you know, sometimes you need to convince people. Um, all right, so kind of back to the beginning. I said, I think that there is an exploration workflow, just like for hydrocarbons, that we should kind of consider when it comes to CCS. So if CCS really becomes a big business and an important, uh, make, can make, wants to make an important contribution to our uh, CO2 challenge today, then we do need to have some form of workflows available to make sure that um, you know we we have the right prospects available for the injection challenges and requirements that we have. So we need to think about a basin scale assessment, the play-based one, and of course, in the end of the day, you know, also uh, on on your prospect scale. And each one has its own you know data and data challenges and 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 different questions. It's the same way as we do it for the petroleum world, right? So whether you use the USGS reporting, uh, you know, asse or assessment for the basin scale, as I showed you at the beginning, or if I look at the the higher resolution geology and uh, and its impact on our plays and our injector locations, in in in, in a better understanding of uh, which which um, um, uh, 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 which um, um, uh, storage site could be the better one to choose, and uh, where do I inject to get the maximum storage capacity? Uh, that's something we can look at the play level. And of course, when it comes to the prospect scale, there we're getting also in this reservoir simulation world, where maybe there's some overlap with reservoir simulators as well, where they may be even better, better equipped to answer those questions that then relate to operation, it's like injection rates and all these things, right? Pressure management of the reservoir, etc. In in the exploration world for hydrocarbons, we use this so-called exploration funnel, and we do all these assessments. So we have this initially, we have lots of different, you know, uh, leads um, that we then mature to prospects, and we have a lot of them, and then we we make a we have a selection of those that are you know very likely to be uh, uh, economic, and then we have another decision gate. To reduce them further until we have a drillable prospect that we would like to use for an exploration well and and i think and so for for the ccs market um that follows the same logic in my opinion right remember you don't want to sell a, a, an injection site to a customer and then after five years of injection you have a leakage and the government will tell you oh, oh, oh you're going to shut down operations and pay a hefty penalty not just to the government but also to your to your customer because you cannot fulfill the sequestration contract anymore 
So that's a very um, uh, that's clear that we need this kind of uh, uh, assessment uh, um, workflow to make sure that we know what we're doing. Okay, very last slide. Then we can answer some questions. Um, so, what are we planning? As I said before, anyone who wants to uh, 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 use our, our tools for uh, CCS applications is invited, of course, to talk to us because. I feel, we feel that we can only make this happen in, uh, together. Um, we have some ideas, but it doesn't mean that they really solve all your questions. Um, and uh, so it's really fundamental for us to work with you to make sure that we do the right things as fast as possible to give you solutions that work best. So of course, we need to look at uh, the CO2 properties. How does it behave in the subsurface? On, on, you know, with maybe simplifications and to, to, to look at the basin scale, right? Um, we need to implement, of course, uh, you know, I mentioned before this uh, the cementation carbonization uh, uh, model. So, uh, you know, to quantify better this uh, carbonate uh, 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 container. Um, also, of course, the dissolution. Um, so, dissolution of, of carbonate, I mean, here. But of course, the dissolution of CO2 already showed, we can already do, that's a standard and default. Um, same with the, um, um, uh, with the diffusion. But if the water is dissolved in the water phase, sorry, the CO2 is dissolved in the water phase uh, and the water moves due to compaction driven flow, for instance, um, that CO2 is not transported with it at the moment. So that's of course something we would like to uh, uh, use as well, implement as well to make sure that it, that is covered. Um, and of course, there's a few UI elements that, of course, would be nice to have for, for example, the basin scale assessment to have some automation there and some, some automatic reporting that looks great and, and so on. Um, another important piece that came to my mind while I was putting up together this presentation is actually, is our migration algorithm and our workflows actually fit for this purpose properly? Because um, you know, I remember I said at the beginning, if I have all these assessment units and the storage containers, especially when it comes to the residual storage container, how do I fill this? Especially if I look at my migration algorithm here that produces these nice little migration, uh, you know, meandering rivers kind of thing. Um, that's a very focused flow. It's not like a big plume. The plume you have at the injection site, even with, in our tool, you saw it maybe on one of the slides. But after that, it focuses into these migration paths. And is this real? Is this really occurring in the in the real world, or do we have this front moving through the subsurface um, and saturating everything on its on its path? This is the key question. Um, if so, on millions of years, so the hydrocarbon migration. I think this is a very good um, uh, uh, way of, of of depicting this this flow. But is it good enough for our purpose here on this much shorter period of time? Um, as well, that's a question that uh, maybe we need to 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 look at as well. So, um, fit for purpose modeling workflows, fit for purpose processes such as carbonization, such as the water flow with the CO two in it, etc. That needs that is, uh, I think the, the critical challenges. With that, I'm open for questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. It was excellent presentation and. Uh... Now, basically, if you raise your hand, I can read up. First, uh, I, I just want to start. There was one question in the chat, and now it's three. But I start from the first one. Uh, basically, Tor Ellen Garden is asking, can we model near surface CO2 hydrate formation of any leaking CO2 in the same simulation run, or is that a special case and scenario? CO2 hydrate no. formation. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can uh, I can uh, uh, answer. Uh, it's Thomas uh, Hanschler here. Um, uh, yes, we can. Uh, you have to exchange these uh, and uh, the PVD diagram for the for the methane hydrate uh, formation by the CO2 hydrate formation. Uh, that is the reflexible input. And if so, and you and uh, of course you need a, a, a very detailed understanding of the pressure and temperature. Then uh, the hydrates are calculated and uh, and uh, reported accordingly. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. The next question, uh, I mean, again, it's a follow up question. Also, potential microbial fixation in shallow sediments C column. I think probably not, but you, you might answer. Micro, micro. Yeah, microbes 
fixating the uh, CO2 shadow sediments. Okay, 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 I got it. Uh, no, of course, that's something we don't model because, um, but as you may know, that even, you know, any biological, um, any biological um, activity is difficult uh, to represent to be represented in somewhat in a physical model. So uh, the same applies, of course, to the bio, you know, biogenetic gas generation, which we kind of try to mimic a little bit. But again, overall, it's always some form of temperature pressure dependency in our terms. So it's always difficult to have these microbial um, 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 processes you know, simulated in the way that we do it, at least. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, next question. I'm, I'm just writing from the uh, reading from the chat. Christian Bransegg is asking from uh, Explorer Nautilus Carbon. Excellent talk, Daniel, including the smell uh, use case or a case study. Could you elaborate the merit of using pattern mode versus eclipse from screening hmm. towards detailed reservoir simulation? So, what is the advantage of using pattern mode? What is the advantage of using eclipse? Well, um, first of all, um, I think. There, there are two things. One is, of course, the 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 the, the basin scale aspect. Of course, that we are looking at. So I'm not I'm not saying there's any competition. I think we are uh, we are you know mutually helping each other um, when we go through this funnel, as I mentioned, right? Um, that you know at 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 when when we apply a reservoir simulator, we do that for a good reason for oil and gas. And we should do the same thing for the CO2 as well. So when it comes to operations questions, when it comes to to, uh, to management of the reservoir and of management of the injection operations, I think then of course the tools like Eclipse or Intersect will be uh, the perfect uh, tool of choice. Especially because the questions that I tried to address here today, they are already all answered, right? They are answered. It's like okay, what is the seal capacity? You know, uh, um, you know these kind of things. They are not the questions you you can answer with a with a reservoir simulator, right? This is something that we can answer because that's our tool is made for that purpose. And so um, um, I think that's, we are not, you're not in competition. We are actually, you know, um, benefiting from each other just the way like we do for the hydrocarbon world as well. Yeah, good answer, very good. I agree completely that the two tools are just complementing each other. So there's the next question from, maybe I'm pronouncing wrong, Ruai Reed Salman. Excellent presentation, Daniel. Thank you very much. Like how you handle the residual challenge at the basin scale. So any comment on that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And I, I don't have a, I don't have an answer yet because we don't have enough experience, honestly. And I think that's why I'm, you know, um, I'm really asking for everyone who wants to do a case study uh, with us, uh, uh, you know, please contact us and uh, we're very happy to do that. We need this experience. We need to understand what are you know what we need to try to, to achieve, and and what needs to be changed in our in our uh, tools in our uh, you know, uh, models in our from an input perspective, but also from a from a simulator perspective um, to make that happen. I think this is a this is certainly a challenge, and um, um, I think what we try to achieve, of course, is to 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 get as much CO2 into the under into the subsurface um, with at least the, the minimal amount of wells. So again, it's the same as draining a reservoir, right? You would like to drill as, as few wells as possible, and hence we do this kind of you know we do make the, all this basin analysis and then of course the the reservoir modeling to achieve that, right? So this is exactly the same um, uh, kind of question, yeah. All right, so the next one is from Peter Seigel. Do you use capillary entry pressure to seal to the seal as a limit for acceptable column height and uh, therefore the maximum storage resource capacity or the, the storage capacity? However, capillary entry does not necessarily mean any major containment loss during the required storage period as long as there is low enough seal permeability. Can you include mm -hmm. loss over time in yeah. your simulation due to capillary or this leakage? Maybe yeah, I can right. I can take this. Uh, the, the, of course, the, the, especially using the invasion percolation method, uh, is an ideal case where no permeability at all is considered. That means, sir, uh, you only deal with these column heights uh, and uh, controlled by the cap anti pressures. And that also is, uh, by the way, the, the model what you use for uh, for an, uh, the reservoir simulator. So if the, the cap anti pressure you enter for the seal is high enough, then there is no leakage at all. But in reality, if the cap anti pressure is lower because 
because you have some ligature and uh, locations there, then uh, the, the, it is controlled by the permeability of the yield, right? And this needs uh, a Darcy flow simulator. And if uh, applying something, then uh, we would recommend then to 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 move to uh, to eclipse to do that uh, quite right right as uh, uh, then these uh, basin modeling type simulators are not good enough uh, to uh, to control this but the, by the way this uh, invasion percolation this quick look scenario to have a first idea means that you have seconds or maybe minutes of um, maximum minutes of uh, simulation time and you can run scenarios uh, that's why this is uh, i would say an early assessment and then compared to the detailed reservoir simulator, which then and of course also takes uh, more time to, for a detailed analysis for each run. Right? But again, then of course the scene needs to be part of that reservoir model, right? So traditionally yeah. that's not the case necessarily, but that of course, so there is also, it doesn't mean that if you just feed this into a reservoir simulator, that, it, that the simulator is, is fit for that purpose. So no one, you know, I don't know, I'm not an, I'm not an expert in that. I'm just saying that, you know, I could imagine that uh, because that has never been a question at this very low, you know, to model this, the flow through this very low permeability uh, units, um, that it may not be fit for that purpose either right now, right? It doesn't mean it, it cannot change, but it's something, of course, again, we need these studies, we need to work together to make this, uh, to make sure that we, to, you know, work on the right, right aspects. And I think this is a very good point. And I think this reminds me very much also on this, you know, on the shallow gas, right? So what, how can it be that there's shallow gas accumulations from biogenic gas produ production, for instance, right? Um, if the cap sea capacity for cap entry pressure is so low, and I also I think also that there is a balance between permeability and, and, and methane generation rate of by the bio biogenic reactions, right? Um, just like here, it can be, absolutely. Um, so uh, that's absolutely right. Um, the permeability is something we need to consider here. Yeah, good point. So there was a question and also raised hand from Lukas Krausinski. Maybe I'll just read it up fast. Fantastic presentation, Daniel. Do you calculate your plume expansion around the injection well in Petromod, or do you import it from a simulation tool or other software? So the injection. No, that one, yeah, yeah. So what you saw there is is from Petromod directly. Let me just. Um, what is this? What's? I think you mean. Yeah, you see that, right? So here, this is what you see here is the vertical plume, right? The injection at the bottom, and it kind of, you know, makes this kind of upside down Christmas tree, and then it flows under the seal upwards, right? That's what you see here, right? See that? Yeah, so the main injection is actually at the bottom here, and then you have this upwards oh, yeah, plume muted, uh, that migrates up to yeah. underneath here, right? And and so that is what you see here, and that is that is real. This is this is uh, um, this is direct from Petromod, not important at all. Yeah, and you see it's very uniform. Yes, yes. Plume because I from geology, right? Yep, no, uh, no all, all good. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. Yeah, maybe I have bad network, so if I'm kicked out because of IT, then just continue and close it for. Just one more question from somebody, uh, Marharai Lao Okok. Thank you for your presentation, excellent. I have one question related to migration. Um, did the injector simulation also involve lateral stress for the lateral migration because as far as i know basin model only calculate burial vertical stress uh, maybe i can take it uh, again it's uh, uh, indeed the standard uh, standard simulation comes with this uh, vertical tasagi pop pressure uh, and vertical stress uh, solution but of course you can switch on the 3d stress uh, that's easy to say but uh, in in reality it, it it needs some understanding of the not only of the properties uh, also from the boundary conditions which is uh, more complicated than it, it looks like from the from the first glance uh, but it, it it's inside what is the the effect of the stress um, uh, the, the major effect of the stress on migration is a different one. It's on is on failure and fracturing. The stress causes failure and uh, fracturing with additional flow lines which are followed, right? And this the second effect that the stress also influences the pore pressure. It's it's there, and the pore pressure influences the migration path directly, right? That's also there, but it's uh, it's minor compared to this uh, failure effect. So far, um, I would say this is what you directly describe is not so important in in uh, most okay. cases. Mm. But there's one aspect that maybe that I need to add as well is that what I didn't talk about either is if we use this failure analysis, 
then of course we also will have a you know if that could be also an, an uncertainty on your ceiling uh, uh, integrity then of course that's certainly something that also um, could be at least assessed in that way right so that um, uh, this is a, the failure is not you know not just for the for the lateral migration but also for the ceiling um, could be an important issue right or yeah, that's reactive, what I meant that's uh, what I meant. You know, how you know exactly reactivation of existing fractures you know yeah. what what you know, we can calculate these paleo fractures and their orientation at least right not so not as physical entities but they are the likelihood of being present and if they are present at what orientation and what density um and then we can look at okay what is the present day stress field and how likely is it to reactivate these uh, with an injection for instance right that could be also something that can be that can be done and I didn't talk about that today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just the last question, I, at least what I see is that Gillian Dark there is asking: You use scenarios to illustrate the impact of changing a single variable. Can you do Monte Carlo simulation on a range of variables? I think the answer is yes, but it can be complicated. Yes, exactly. The answer is yes. Um, uh, Deconvoluting then their, the individual influences is always a challenge. Uh, I, I do know that there are some people who say it's easy. Um, <laughs> others say it's not easy. So I think, um, yeah, I, th I personally prefer to use one and then the next one and uh, maybe combine then a few where I know how they influence, influence each other. Um, and uh, yeah, so I only looked at that um, erosion and uh, uncertainty in this case, right? And I showed only three examples, but in reality, I actually uh, had the, the simulator calculated uh, uh, 20 automatically, right? Based on an uncertainty that I set. So I only showed uh, a few because uh, um, that would, would was easier. But uh, yeah, that's um, certainly something we can do, yeah. Yeah, in Petro Moderance, you can done all these risks, but it takes quite a lot of time. So it can be optimized with the size of the model and the size of the changes and variables and so on. But yeah, I yeah, think yeah. it's possible, but you have to be very like um, mathematically talented to see what it is actually meaning when yeah. you do this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I'm a geologist. <laughs> yeah. So one last question, yeah. probably because time is running out. So it's from Martin Munge from, I guess, Repsol. Excellent presentation, Daniel. Are CO2 and water miscible in your IP simulator? What would be the best approach to model CO2 injection in depleted oil and gas reservoirs? Um, on, on, on a reservoir scale, I would say use, use uh, Eclipse or Intersect. <laughs> um, to be honest, um, if that's if you, especially if you have still some oil and gas inside, and you would like to look at that how it's being displaced, it's displaced, and all these things, I assume that the 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 methodologies are more sophisticated to answer that question. Uh, I would say yes, it's, it's still possible. Of course, uh, CO2 and water miscible. That is what what was explained with uh, with uh, a detailed uh, model for uh, dissolving CO2 in in water, and uh, we are even working on the more a sophisticated model uh, to have a better equilibrium between the gases and the in water phase uh, based on more sophisticated PPT models. And uh, uh, the depleted reservoirs uh, can be handled by internal boundary conditions, uh, which you can uh, assign uh, to uh, 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 on well locations. But then you need to know uh, what uh, what the depletion uh, what the depletion history was. Uh, then you can apply this. Uh, that can be taken into account. Sure, you can do it, but I think you know if you have already a reservoir model uh, with all the necessary uh, uh, input, then it's certainly uh, you know um, something that you might want to look at. I guess. Yes. Yes. Of course. So, anybody uh, last question in the chat? It's two minutes left. <laughs> or raise a hand, and then we just give a room for one last question. I think we close at four in order to keep time. If there's no more question, I just uh, would like to uh, emphasize again how 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 uh, happy we would be, how happy we would be if you guys contact us. Anyone who has a story has a case study that they would like to get supported from us, we are there to support you, right? Because you will support us, uh, and so that's the uh, that's I can only uh, advertise this once again in the last minute here, and uh, so we are looking forward for your conversations. Yep, thank you very much for your talk and your nice work, Daniel and Thomas and Carlos. And uh, basically, I'm sure it will be a lot of discussion internally oh, yes. in different companies and between you and between 
Schlumberger or the Petromot team and other uh, tools and softwares about these issues because it's a lot of things we have to understand and, and uh, physical processes describe and, and model mathematically properly. So thank you very much for the presentation and your time from all of you. I think it was one of the records. We had more than 90 people participating and then it was recorded. Now the recording will close at four o'clock and it will be available later on on the FORCE uh, YouTube website or on the, from the FORCE web page. You can get the video later on. So thank you very much for your time, Daniel, and Thomas and Carlos, and for all of you who participated. And I think now, Lynn or Tona, you can close the recording and have a good afternoon for all of you in Europe.